want to talk to you about um, what is automated machine learning and why we want it and what's the current state of the art sort of. Um, none of this is actually going to be my research, but I hope I can give you like a good overview of what's happening. So uh, first, why do we want automated machine learning? So my personal goal is to make machine learning accessible to everybody. Ideally, you shouldn't need to like read a book or do even like a uh, degree in machine learning or data science to apply machine learning to a problem. Um, unfortunately, that's not really where we are. It's really very important right now with the tools we have. It's really important to have a really good understanding of what's going on on a technical side to make use of any machine learning. Um, so, and I want to build better tools that can uh, bridge this gap a little bit. So, what are the issues that are with uh, that we have with current tools? So, for example, Scikit-Learn, because that's the tool I work on most, but it's similar with other tools. Um, so what are the issues that you face as a beginner if you want to start with machine learning using scikit-learn? So I said none of this will be my work, but the problems that you get are probably my uh, work, at least in part. So one of the problems is there's a lot of different uh, algorithms out there. You need to f uh, first formulate your problem as machine learning a problem, then you need to pick the right model. So a couple of years ago, I made this ridiculous flowchart uh, of how to approach machine learning problem. It was actually meant as a joke, but a lot of people really liked it because it gave them some place to start from, some guidance into how to enter a machine learning problem. Um, and so, which shows how, how difficult this is for a beginner. So the idea was to t tell people a bit what model is appropriate for what task. But even if you know this, then there's another problem, which is how do you uh, tune this model to work well for your um, data set and for your problem? Each of these models come with um, many, many hyperparameters. In scikit-learn, there are actually, some of them are intrinsic to the model, some of them are for the optimization, some of them are just some special use cases. So if you look at here, this is a support vector machine which usually has like parameters, a kernel, kernel parameters and regularization. But if you look at what it actually has, it has like 10 and uh, they're maybe not as obvious what they are. And so there's an intrinsic problem in tuning the algorithm, but there's also a problem of um, how is this exposed to the user? So um, if you're new to machine learning, this can be quite overwhelming, quite challenging to uh, apply to a new problem. Uh, another problem is um, with preprocessing. So uh, scikit-learn is designed in a way that you have to do everything explicitly. If you look at other toolboxes, for example, in R, um, tools are more sort of automatic and they try to do some preprocessing for you. Um, in scikit-learn, everything um, is sort of the plain algorithm more or less like it is published in a sense. So, um, which means if you have a real data set, you need to take care of the encoding of categorical variables or other variables. You need to make sure that there's no missing values. You need to make sure that the data is on a, a certain scale that makes sense for your model. And so here, uh, here you'd see what you would need to do to apply a support vector machine on a standard data set is, yeah, uh, encoding of categoricals, imputation, uh, scaling. And so uh, the reason scikit-learn does it this way is to give the user a lot of control. But on the other hand, if you don't do this, things will either work very badly or break. And so again, you need a lot of domain knowledge to know what do I actually need to do to my data before I can apply a machine learning model. And this is another like stumbling stone for a beginner. <coughs> so what I would like to have instead is I just want to have an automatic model, say an auto classifier that I can uh, fit on any, any data and it'll uh, just keep iterating and provide me with better and better models over time. So if I wait longer, I get, longer, uh, get better and better models and it just finds a good pipeline for me. Um, this is in contrast to like sort of having to figure out everything by myself and then needing to uh, tune it. Um, there's actually a library out there called AutoSKLR that does something like this. And there's also several commercial services that do something like this. There's like, I think one is by H2O, one is by DataRobot, and maybe other companies have other things like this, but there's not really um, a good framework to do this right now, uh, open source or commercial, I would say. Now, obviously I want an open source one. So what do we need to do to get there? There's several pieces to this. The arguably uh, simple, 
well, maybe simplest piece, is to um, automate the search procedure. Let's say you know what model you want to use. Say you want to use a support vector machine or a neural network or a random forest, and you want to tune just the parameters of this model. So there's um, a large body of work on how to do this. This is basically, um, given a particular search space and a measure that you want to optimize, say accuracy, um, how can I find the best setting of the parameters? So and I'll talk in depth more about this later. The second part is not only uh, select the parameters of the model, but also select the pipeline and, uh, uh, sorry, not just select uh, the parameters, but also select the model. So um, possibly it, say I want to uh, support vector machine on this problem, random forest on this problem, and so on. And uh, one step further is selecting actually the complete pipeline. How do you extract features? How do you pre-process the data? How do you do every single step that is required from the raw data? And so you have sort of uh, searching over parameters, searching over models, and then searching over pipelines as uh, more, it's harder and harder problems. So how are we gonna um, approach this? So the first thing you need to do is, even for the first step, is you need to formalize the search space. So you need to say, uh, what are the models and parameters I wanna search over? And this already is kind of uh, tricky. So there's uh, a mixture of discrete and continuous parameters you might wanna search over. There's conditional parameters. For example, in neural network, you have to give the size of every layer. But um, like the size of the second hidden layer only matters if you actually have two hidden layers. So the importance of one parameter or the existence of one parameter is actually dependent on what, a, what the other parameters are set to. So that makes the search a little bit tricky because the space is sort of tree-shaped. Um, and then there's a the question of how do you want to search over these pipelines? Do you say, oh, I'm always gonna do scaling and imputation and then uh, feature selection and this, or um, am I just gonna allow arbitrary computation graphs? And um, that sort of, these choices make a real big difference in uh, how the system will work in the end. And uh, then also you need to sort of figure out a way how to, um, what, what to include in the search space. So you could say, oh, I'm gonna search over everything that's possible in scikit-learn or everything that's in R or everything that's in Weka. And, uh, but the question is, is that a good approach? But also on the other side, and say, oh, I'm always just gonna use a random force, it's probably gonna work out fine. And so the question is, what is the right search space, and what are the right parameter ranges to search over? So once you've done that, you need to figure out a search method. So now, let's say you have this relatively complexly shaped, pretty big uh, search space that contains all the parameters and all the pipelines and all the models. And now we need to search over this. So, um, the search is usually for something like cross-validated accuracy. So um, this, this is sort of a global optimization problem because um, there's, there's very little that we know about this function. How do, well is, does cross-validated accuracy do as a function of the parameters or the pipeline? You can certainly not uh, compute a derivative of it or, and it's pre I'm pretty sure it's not convex, so you just need to have some search function that can work with this very complex co function on this very big space. So the first and one of the most commonly used methods is just exhaustive search. Search all possible combinations, um, also called grid search. This works reasonably well if you fix most of the steps and say, oh, I just want to search the parameters of uh, the random force or the parameters of, of the SVM. If you want to search over many different pre-processing steps, many different models, um, the search space becomes exponentially larger with each step that you add, basically, and this be quickly becomes uh, infeasible. Another problem is that there's, you can't really uh, stop this at, if you say you run out of time, because you're scanning the space in like a very regular uh, manner that means you basically have to wait to the end before you get any reasonable result. So 
that's good if you have like very small search space, but otherwise it's actually not a very good strategy. Um, another straightforward method is just uh, randomly sample from the space that you have. Uh, somewhat surprisingly, this is actually much better already. In particular, if you work on uh, spaces that are continuous and discrete, um, sampling from continuous um, parameter spaces instead of defining a grid um, makes the search much more efficient. Also, a randomized search, you can stop at any point. You can just say, okay, now I searched enough, uh, and I take just the best result I have so far. Or if you have more budget, you can uh, keep searching. If you define a grid, and in the end, you got some result, but you say, oh, I actually have more computational budget, it's very hard to spend this budget um, like in an obvious manner. Um, yeah, so, so this actually works already much better. There's actually, yeah, there's a cool paper by Baxter and Benjo from, oh, I don't know, a couple years ago uh, that talks about how does randomized search consistently beats grid search if you have continuous uh, parameters. And if you're interested in this kind of stuff, you should read it. So the next kind of uh, method that is one step in complexity up is uh, what's called Bayesian optimization or sequential model-based optimization, SMBO. <laughs> so here the idea is that, well, we have this very um, expensive to evaluate function that train a model and evaluate it using cross-validation, um, and we have no structure on the space, but we want to optimize it. So the idea here is that you build a model you, of this uh, function, like cross-validated accuracy, given the observations that you have so far. And you build this model using a function that's sort of, that's uh, smooth or at least dif differentiable, and then you optimize this function using some off-the-shelf optimizer. So um, a common um, approach to this is use the Gaussian process. Use the Gaussian process to model all the values of accuracy that you observed so far as a function of the parameters, and then run um, like LBFGS or something like this on the Gaussian process to find a uh, minimum. And evaluating the uh, Gaussian process or whatever parameterized function you have that you fit to the um, model, to the data, uh, is much, much easier and much, much faster than trying to retrain a model. So I want to run through a brief example here. So let's say we have a um, model with one continuous parameter, which is on the x-axis, and uh, accuracy, or whatever we want to optimize, is on the y-axis. And so um, the, true f the true dependence of the accuracy on um, the parameter is the, dot the dashed red line. And so we start off by trying randomly one parameter. Uh, I don't know. Uh, sorry, I don't, I don't have a pointer, I think. So, and we, so we try something like minus 0.4 or something, and we observe uh, an outcome. And so what we're doing now is we try to build a function that models this outcome. Right now we only have one data point, so there's not a lot of information. So we basically build a constant function, which is the purple function. You can see a purple line, and then there's a, some standard deviation. Now we look at what is the next best point to try. And uh, the next point we want to try is one that is um, going to be good, but also that gives us more information about how the function looks like. So we don't necessarily want to find the um, highest point that we have, or sorry, we're minimizing, find the lowest point, but we want to um, find a point that is low, but also th uh, that gives us uh, new information. You can use that using what's called the lower confidence bound, which basically looks at the um, lower contour of the standard deviation. So we look at the lower contour of the standard deviation of the purple thing, and uh, this is this green function you see at the bottom. We, so this we now have, we have the derivative, we can compute anything we want about this, so we minimize this. Minimizing this is easy, and we find the minimum is, this, uh, is here on this border. <coughs> So now we can train our model using this parameter setting, and we observe another outcome, which is the second panel up there. Now we have two data points. We can retrain the model, uh, which gives us a new purple model uh, of what the function looks like, which gives us a new lower confidence bound 
here, which we can minimize again efficiently, which gives us a new proposal point, and we can go on and on. So in this process, we try iteratively new points that are proposed using this lower confidence bound, and um, we get a more and more accurate model of the original function. As you can see, the purple model is, uh, will be a very good model of the um, red function around the minimum. We're only interested in a minimum of the function. We're not interested in modeling the whole function. We just want to find a minimum. So this, is a, this strategy is pretty general. Here it's done with a Gaussian process. You can basically use any other function you like. People try, uh, like to use random forests too. Um, and this works uh, better than random search usually, but not by a lot. So this is, if you know global optimization, it's an NP-hard optimization problem. So um, there's not that many guarantees you can have how well this performs on an actual problem. Um, yeah, so there's a couple of common models that people like to use. As I mentioned, there's uh, Gaussian processes, uh, random forests, which is with an implementation called SMAC, and then there's some non-parametric um, method that's a little bit older. And um, so they all have different strengths and weaknesses, actually. I don't want to go into the details too much. Oh, well, maybe I'll just quickly run through it. So the Gaussian process is basically what basically everybody uses in the literature. Uh, but it can't really work with discrete parameters, which is not great for um, what we want to do because we want to optimize between different models, say between using a random forest and a neural network. That's a discrete parameter. Gaussian processes can't really deal well with that. It's, really, it's not that scalable to many, many evaluations. So if your search space is big, you probably need to have a lot of data points, and then the Gaussian process becomes slow. And it's a little unclear how to handle conditional parameters. So. For example, that the size of the nth layer only matters if you have n layers in your network. But there's many implementations, many of them very high quality, and um, you only need to, for each parameter uh, that's continuous, you only need to specify the bounds. Um, random forests are sort of more flexible because they're tree-based methods, and they can deal with discrete parameters, they can deal with conditional parameters, they're scalable, but there's only like one implementation out there, there's only one group working on it, unfortunately. And um, if you want to specify the continuous parameters, you need to specify a prior. Um, and then the, the non-parametric model is like, it's uh, basically there was one person working on it and he uh, created a startup and so, um, but it works actually quite well. All right, so this is now, let's say we have defined a search space uh, and now we have sort of a smart method to search over it. That would mean that uh, basically whenever we encounter a new machine learning problem, we have this giant search space and we have a smart search method and now we're gonna try out all the different things that we can. And we explore using this like Bayesian optimization. That's not really how a uh, human expert would approach this. A human expert would use prior knowledge. So, how are you going to do that? So using prior knowledge for this automatic machine learning is what's called meta-learning. Uh, or um, that's some, which is some form of warm starting the search. So instead of starting the search from scratch each time, we want, to, um, we want to build up a knowledge base of what models perform well and use this knowledge in the future. So. The way that method learning is usually formulated is you start off with some data set. You run this optimization process on it that we just described, which probably takes like quite a while, and, uh, but then in the end, it spits out a good model. So, all right, so we did that once. Then we take another data set and another data set, and we run this optimization. This optimization takes quite a while, but in the end, we find some good models. But now we want to encode this into um, a model that, uh, so that we can use this as prior knowledge. The way we do this is that we extract what's called meta features from the data set. So these are properties of the data set. For example, how many samples are there? Um, how many features are there? Are they sparse? What are the standard deviations? How many classes are there? And so on. So properties that describe 
the data set, like one feature vector per data set. And then we can uh, learn a machine learning model that basically recommends, based on these meta features, uh, what algorithms and parameters to use. So we're trying to predict from the meta features um, a new pipeline and parameter settings. Like you could see how um, this might work with uh, nearest neighbors. Let's say um, we find the problem that we saw that's most similar and we're just going to apply the same model that, that we found there. This will definitely be better than just starting to search from scratch. Yeah, and so in general, if you have a new data set, you, will, um, you, can you can extract the meta features, you apply your machine learning model, your meta model, and it spits out some parameters. And this now is much, much faster than running the search. This is just um, extracting the features and then running the model to predict, not uh, doing this search over this big space using uh, Bayesian optimization or whatever. Um, yeah, which brings us to the problem. Okay, what are these meta features? Um, so I, I already listed a couple of them already. Um, this is actually still quite an open problem. One, um, one meta feature that actually works very well is so-called landmark features, which are how well does machine learning model X do on this problem. For example, you can compute very quickly how well do decision stamps work on this problem, how well does um, linear model work on this problem, how well does naive Bayes work on this model, uh, on this problem, and use this as, as landmarks to figure out how well other models will work. But this is really something that leads, needs like a lot more work. So, yeah, I want to talk about uh, a little bit more now, uh, what are the existing approaches out there, um, mostly from more uh, systems or software perspective. There's like a giant amount of research out there, uh, and there's like a lot of papers being published at each conference, machine learning conference, but I want to more uh, focus on the practical aspects because I actually want to solve problems. So, I think the best contender so far is what's called auto SK Learn. There's uh, a few, few friends of mine from Freiburg uh, published this, mo uh, this model, and it's on GitHub, and uh, you can download it and try it out. And basically what it does is implements one version of this auto classifier. And um, th this has a fixed pipeline. I think it always does um, one hot encoding, imputation, uh, scaling, feature selection, uh, feature transformation, and then a model. So it's like five or six steps. Uh, and then they search over all, basically everything that's in scikit-learn for each of these steps, or everything that makes sense. So they have, and they have a hand-tuned search space of what kind of parameter settings to search over. Um, they use the random forest for their, uh, for the search, and then they also have meta-learning, but the meta-learning they use is just uh, nearest neighbor. So they do nearest neighbor on the meta features, find a model, um, for that and then start to search from this. So they do warm starting of their search using meta learning. Um, related to a somewhat older project is AutoWicca. It does something very similar, only it um, just searches for models. So there's no pipeline, it's just it tries out uh, different models um, and the parameters, obviously. You can use it with both SMAC, which is a tree based method, and with the a uh, non-parametric method. Uh, it doesn't do any meta-learning though, and uh, yeah, it doesn't do any pre-processing. So this uh, just searches over models and parameters, and obviously it searches over the ones that are in Becca. Yeah, there's also HyperOpt sklearn, which tries to do something similar to auto sklearn, only it doesn't do pipelines, and it's not maintained anymore, so I don't really miss my time with. Another one that's quite interesting, uh, is from another uh, friend of mine from uh, UPenn. It's called TPOUT. Um, so what this does is actually quite a different um, approach. This doesn't use Bayesian optimization and doesn't, so it doesn't use the standard uh, search. It uses um, genetic programming. So it's, it's confusing because the ones use Gaussian processes, the others use genetic programming, and both people try to uh, use the acronyms GP but they are completely different. So this uses uh, genetic programming to build arbitrary complex pipelines 
um, and arbitrary complex um, computation graphs um, to optimize the pipeline, the parameters, and everything, basically. And so I don't think they actually need to specify a search space for this. They basically, they just need to specify the operators of how it's possible to combine things. <laughs> I haven't really seen a good comparison on how well this works, but at, that, at least from a conceptual perspective, it's quite, quite interesting. So these are actually the only packages that try to do all of these things that I talked about. And only one of them does uh, meta learning. So there's only, yeah, so there's not a lot of meta learning out there that's like practical. Um, there's a couple of packages that uh, just do the search part, and uh, that's a very important part, so I want to talk about this in a little bit more detail. So most of these are for Gaussian processes. There's one by the, from the lab that uh, basically, like, I think they proposed this uh, approach, or at least they uh, championed it for quite a while. Um, it's called Spermint, and it was developed for neural networks, and it, uh, I think was used qu uh, quite intensively in like the neural network community. Uh, but then they made a company out of it, then the company got bought by Twitter, and now this is not maintained anymore. And then they, then they all quit Twitter and went to Google, I think. Um, so, okay, pretty cool. Uh, another implementation of Gaussian process-based search is uh, GPyOpt. It's from the group of, um, uh, Oh my God, Neil Lawrence in uh, Sheffield. So he's like a god with GP, so this is really solid stuff. It's, well, it's built on uh, GPy, which is their Gaussian process libraries, which is probably the Gaussian process library. And so um, it also did pretty well in benchmarks that, that I ran. Um, so that's pretty cool. There's also Scikit Optimize, which is done by my friends that also do Scikit Learn. Um, this actually tries to implement all kind of different optimization methods. So it has Gaussian process-based stuff, has random forest-based stuff, um, a gradient boosting, randomized search, and so on. And yeah, and so, so that's sort of, uh, but these libraries are all, they do search, they do global optimization and arbitrary search spaces. So these are uh, helpful building blocks for doing automatic ML, but they don't specify any of the parameter ranges. So you need to do a lot of work to actually use them for automatic machine learning. So I want to show some uh, brief benchmarks on how these methods compare. Um, so this is actually like really silly benchmark because the, uh, so this is just, uh, uh, this is just doing parameter search and global optimization for very simple problems. So the first two are actually like artificial global optimization problems in, I think they're both in like two dimensions. So they're very s small. And then there's logistic regression, um, linear discriminant analysis in the SVM. Um, and so this, this is from um, a paper from the group that created Spearmint. They proposed a thing that's a deep neural network that's on the right, and so that one wins always. Um, but you can see that there's um, basically, uh, the GPs do very well on these small low dimensional functions. They're all mostly smooth. Um, and SMAC and TPE it do uh, reasonably well. Um, I also have, uh, this is actually done by someone that does, that works on uh, Scikit Optimize. And Scikit Optimize doesn't win, so I trust this a lot more. Um, so they say GPyOpt actually does the best. He ran it over, I don't know, 10 different benchmark data sets. These are all very small data sets and they're not really, so this is only benchmarking the search part, not the whole um, AutoML part. And so, um, yeah, the GPyOpt does the best and uh, some of the second optimized ones do also pretty well. But actually, um, most of them do relatively well. And he published the benchmark and the code and he published uh, a Docker container to run the benchmark, and so I like him a lot. Um, so, all right, I think that's enough benchmarks. So, there's another, well, one interesting benchmark that has sort of an interesting criticism to it. Um, so you might not be able to, so this is a comparison of um, some of the algorithms I described, SMAC, run, uh, 
So this is doing, it's a benchmark for doing the complete uh, automatic machine learning um, thing, like building a new pipeline. Mm -hmm. And uh, it compares SMAC, TPE, and uh, random search. And um, just using a random forest, hyperband, which is what they proposed, which is a really cool method, but I'm not going to talk about it. And uh, then random search 2x. And the interesting here is, so random search 2x basically means we just run a random search, but we run it on two computers in parallel. And uh, if you look at this, so, I mean, basically there's two criticisms in here. One is, oh, and the way to, to read this is this is average rank over many data sets over number of evaluations. So you start on the left and you give it more and more time to compute. And uh, the one that is lowest is the winner right now. That gives you the best model. And so there's two criticisms in here. One is uh, the random forest baseline uh, is pretty good. It's not like, at least in the, for quite a while, it, um, it beats some of the other models, which means just running a random forest instead of running uh, automatic machine learning. It's a pretty good idea. Uh, always works. This, the other criticism is that basically all the fancy methods that uh, people publish on, um, particularly the one that they publish on here, the hyperband, they're all contained between doing random, uh, random search and doing random search on two computers at the same time. So that means um, they're not, they're, they're worse than twice or they're less than twice as fast as random search. Um, the good thing about random search is it's embarrassing parallel. You can just run on a cluster because they're completely independent and so you can run a, on a cluster that's as big as you like. So, um, and people poured hundreds and hundreds of hours into optimizing some fancy methods and doing Bayesian optimization, but uh, they not even a factor of two better than doing the stupidest thing possible. So, but they're still somewhat better. So maybe it's still worth doing. Anyhow, so that's, that was an interesting observation. So, um, uh, I have like five more minutes, I think. So I wanna talk about uh, a little bit of uh, what we need to do to push this forward. So as far as I said, there's like, there are some implementations already out there but not that many and they're not that great. They're mostly like research quality. Um, I mean, I love what the people did, but I think there's still a lot to do. So one of the things that there's been very little research on is um, defining the search space of models. So um, that's actually, in practice, it's very important because you don't want to try every possible combination. And it's something where we could uh, put expert knowledge in the system. Also, there's not really a lot of research on how to define the pipeline search space. What are the necessary steps? Uh, do you need to include feature selection? Do you need to include feature extraction? And so on. And um, usually, the, all, most of the methods that I showed you implemented either everything together or they implemented just the optimization method. And so having a clean separation of these uh, pieces and working on these pieces separately um, will also help build much better systems. And so, yeah, we also need to exploit prior knowledge better because right now, as I said, the only implementation that I know of uses uh, one nearest neighbor and um, it's not very usable. And also there's papers that take runtime into consideration, but any, none of the implementations that I know um, do. So what I mean by this is, if you have two models, one is really quick and one takes a long time, they're nearly as good, you want to run a quick model and not the neural network that trains for two weeks. Unless you already spend a lot of time and now you want to really get the last bit. So you need to take into consideration how well you think a model will do compared to how long it might take. And yeah, there's a lot of research on this, but um, not really any implementations. Um, there's also a lot of cool stuff on that data subsampling, but I, again, uh, it's mostly research quality. So in the last uh, two minutes, I wanted to talk about uh, some criticisms of um, 
this AutoML? Because, I mean, there's a lot of people very excited about automatic machine learning. There's also a lot of people not as excited about it. I'm, I'm kind of excited, cautiously excited maybe. Um, so one of them is, I said, that's more a criticism of this, uh, the research on um, Bayesian optimization is that random search works well, and the problem is NP hard. Um, so maybe don't spend too much time on trying to do this. And so you could say, well, okay, I'm just gonna do random search now, and don't bother. bother. Or if I say, okay, 1.5 times speed up is actually important, well, maybe use one of these methods. But um, it doesn't mean AutoML is not useful. It just means that uh, maybe the search part is not the most important part. Um, yeah, another criticism that I also already alluded to is, do we really need to try 100 classifiers? I think uh, may, the system said search over classifiers. Maybe that, I think AutoWaker has over 100. I don't know how many scikit, uh, auto scikit learn has, maybe like 20 or 30. Um, actually, on average, uh, gradient boosting uh, decision trees always win. Um, so do we actually need that many models? And just running a random forest is also a good baseline, so how many models do we actually need? And do we actually need complex pipelines? Like this um, genetic programming that builds arbitrary complex systems, um, do we really need that? It's not really clear. Um, Another cri uh, criticism is people say, oh, well, this will spit out a syst some system that makes predictions, but I can't actually inspect it. In particular, the thing that auto Learn does is it actually builds an ensemble. So it builds, it does a search, it, it finds a couple of good models, and then it averages all of them. Because if you average a bunch of good models, it's always gonna get a little bit better. And so you will, this might build very complex pipelines that are impossible to understand. And so, um, I think that's a valid criticism too, but it's only, you need to make, um, you need to make a decision whether, do, you, do I need my system to be interpretable or not? And I think that's probably a decision you need to make very early in your machine learning uh, process or in your data science process. Um, if you do add click prediction, maybe it's enough uh, to make the right prediction. Maybe if you listen to the keynote, you think it's not enough to make the right, uh, the, the panel discussion is not enough to make the right prediction. You should understand what's going on. Um, but you should think about, am I okay with a black box model? Yes or no? If no, don't do automatic machine learning. Probably. Or make sure the search space is so that anything that comes out of it is useful for you. Um, and one of my favorite criticisms is that it's making it too easy. Uh, what I love about this, I also already got this criticism for scikit-learn. People told me, you make machine learning too easy, now everybody can use it. I was like, really? Well, thank you. Um, and I mean, th there is definitely um, a risk in providing tools and make, giving people just enough tools to be dangerous. Um, you need to still, you, you need to know what you're doing. Like, for example, how to validate models, how to interpret your models, at least to some degree. Um, but I think actually automating more will allow more of the, the uh, framework to be automated, like uh, the validation procedures and so on. So uh, giving a framework that does everything automatically gives more control to the program and so makes abusing it a little bit harder. Mm -hmm. So you can build in more safety mechanisms. Um, actually, another criticism that I didn't put on the slides, maybe because uh, I think it's too valid, is um, this is only like 20% of uh, what a data scientist does. Like if you do look at any uh, survey of what data scientists do, oh, thanks. Um, they spend very little of their time on model building and all of their time on data collection, data pre-processing. And so maybe we just saved uh, data scientists 10% of their time when we, if we solve this perfectly. So, okay. But maybe the other part is too hard to automate, I'm not sure. Okay, I posted the slides, you can look at the material, there's papers and stuff. Um, so for, if you're new to machine learning, you can also buy my book because it, explains like, all the hard parts in an easy way. Okay, yeah, thanks. I think I went slightly over and have like two or three minutes for questions. Does this, yeah. No questions. Yeah. Hmm? Yeah. 
Oh, yeah. As you leave, make sure you fill out or uh, put the uh, colored papers in the basket to, to say uh, how you like the talk. Um, oh. There's also office hours Testing. after the talk okay. in the room down the, uh, the hallway right. if you want to ask Andreas some, some questions. Okay, so I have office hours now. Okay, so I can, I can ask my question now? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay, um, so thanks for the talk, it was good. Thank you. I was just wondering, so, I, so you've discussed a couple, several different approaches, and I'm assuming when you apply the same d several approaches to the same data set, they'll often give not exactly the same models or not exactly the same parameters. How much would you say the, they tend to agree with each other in terms of interpretability? Like, is it the case that two different approaches will give a model that makes sense to everyone, or will they result in two different models that can predict the same data set but give like contradictory interpretations? So, sorry, you mean uh, di different automatic machine learning frameworks? Yeah, or, yeah. There's or, only one. I mean, the, the only one that I know that, that I can download and reasonably run is Auto Learn. Right. <laughs> but like, it, but these these often take like diff these often like some of these methods you talked about. They often have like randomized approaches to yeah. find the correct models, right? Yes. So if you run them over and over again, do they tend to be consistent with the models that they? No. Okay. And I mean that's that's why they ensemble multiple models that are do mm -hmm. reasonably well. Okay. Thanks, Andreas. Other questions? Hi, um, thanks for your talk today. I was wondering if um, there are any tools you might um, recommend or point me to or that you're aware of for automating the um, process of determining which features to extract in the, in, uh, in the process of determining what data you actually feed into an ML model. Um, so you're asking about the other 80% of the actual hard part. Um, and I don't, I'm not a, there's some work on data cleaning, mostly in the database literature. I don't know of any work on automated feature extraction in this framework. Or you could say all of deep learning is that. Um, so Outside of deep learning. Outla <laughs> uh, like an interpretable way to extract features not that, not really. I don't, I'm not really aware of anything. Um, if anyone knows any, please send it my way. There are things like trying to derive rules from the data for data cleaning, but that's the most I know about. It's very hard to benchmark. So there's no benchmark for this. Um, and it's not clear what a benchmark for this would look like. And so that makes it very hard to do research on it. All right. Other questions? Yeah. One over there. When you're building lots of models for the same data, are there ever opportunities for something like dynamic programming where you can reuse some of the earlier computation results? Uh, yes. The thing is that's probably, depending on how you built it, it might be hard to do. Like if you do a grid search with scikit-learn, it will actually uh, happen depending on how you write it. Um, the problem is if you change, um, a pre-processing step, like if you change the scaling of your data, uh, you probably need to rerun everything. Um, even if you build a random forest that would be independent of the scaling, uh, figuring out that you don't actually need to um, rebuild your random forest on differently scaled data is something that I don't think anyone has built a system that can do that. <laughs> 